I've been seeing your uh, videos and wonderful photographs on Facebook Thank about you. your visit to Iceland. Thank you. More than me, it's the place that is so nice that any pictures you take, they're going to be good there. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Uh, but what I want you to talk about today is, I know you are a keen environmentalist and a conservationist at heart. Yeah. So the thoughts that went through your mind while you were seeing the place, taking the pictures, that's what I would like you to share with our audience today. That's definitely a very, very good and very significant point. Because usually when we go for holidays or to destinations which are for leisure, uh, we don't pay much attention to the environmental side or the uh, conservation side or the ecological side of that location. But as you rightly said, my mind always looks for uh, what goes behind the, the normal uh, scene that our naked eyes see. There is a lot that happens in, at the back of it, and which is what appeals a wildlife or a nature or environment lover, really. So I'll, I'll tell you some of the points that probably will highlight this in different ways. First thing is, this is a place, as you yourself have rightly termed as the uh, place where fire and ice both exist together. Yeah. So it's a very tricky kind of a, a habitat or a terrain or the, the, the geographical, geological asset, I must say, because it has so many important things in it, the volcanic reference to it, the purity of water or the purity of air. These are all different things that come together as a as an ecosystem there. And uh, the first thing I would like to say is it is not yet commercialized to the level that you will see the normal destinations that people uh, go for their holidays. Yeah, this is, although it is seen as a popular holiday destination, but still it is quite in its uh, pure state, it's quite in its virgin state, and there is not much of uh, destruction or there is not much of degradation. That is the first thing which I observed, right? Landing from on the airport to the last point where I uh, gave my uh, rental car back, that place itself, there was an evidence of uh, people caring for, uh, you know, the conservation or preservation of uh, natural assets and keeping uh, them in proper shape and, and proper conditions. And this was seen all through the country. And although Iceland is a very small country and compared to many other popular destinations, the area that people visit is, is very small. And uh, the facilities or the amenities are very, very scarce. Like you won't see shops or you won't see any service stations for miles together when you are going on the road. This in a way contributes to the, the kind of health of uh, the environment, I must say, because automatically it reduces a lot of garbage. It reduces a lot of uh, waste on the roads or streets or any, any public place. So if you are moving on the road, all the time that you see is either mountains or grasslands or pure water or waterfalls or lakes. And then after several hundred kilometers, you get to see some, you, you know, human inhabitation or some small village or some, some urban surroundings. So this in a way automatically contributes to, uh, to the conditions that you see there, which is a very good thing. And uh, what I have noticed is when you are, uh, having more amenities and more facilities along the roadside when you are driving on the car, it automatically adds a lot to the degradation, intentional or unintentional, but it starts degrading it much. So my first observation is that because there are not many shops or there are not many service stations, this is a very, very contributing factor for the, the better conditions there. And another challenge which I saw there was there are not so many trees there. 
it, it's more of flat land, volcanic land. So the tree growth is very limited. There are only certain patches of trees which are found randomly in some areas, but there is no forest cover as such, which we usually see in places of which, which got mountains. We got lots of uh, tree growth on the mountain slopes, and that adds to the, the quality of oxygen or purity of air. But in spite of the trees not being there, this place has a very good degree of purity of air. And from the moment you enter the country and you go anywhere, you can drink the, the water anywhere from any stream, any lake, any mountain, waterfall, anywhere you just go, get your bottle, get your glass, pick up the water and you can drink it. That itself tells the, it's the kind of a test of how good the, the conditions are. I mean, this is the first country that probably, in spite of being so tourist uh, heavy country, I don't see the big cans of, big plastic cans of bottled water there. You know, anywhere in the shop, you won't find them. This is one of the most common things that people find when they go for holiday destinations. And I, even I didn't have that idea when I rented my car for going around. The first thing on my list was to pick up some water cans and put them in my uh, car so that they will be with me all the time. But surprisingly, I didn't need them at all. You go anywhere, the tap water is good. The, any lake you see, just go and can have the water. Any waterfall, pure. No, no pollution, no mixing of any urban water in that. No influences of any any chemical or industry bases there, so it, it's all still in a state that we only read in books or we we read it in poems. You know, I never thought there there's a place which exists like that. There are no industries there. There are industries, but industries are are very few, and they are all located in a very planned way around the capital of the country, which is Reykjavik. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reykjavik, as, as it is pronounced, Reykjavik is the pronunciation, but the spelling is Reykjavik. Yeah. No, sir. And throughout this discussion, I'll avoid to say the name because there are so many weird spellings and the pronunciations that I'm very likely to go wrong on that. So, so except for the, for the capital city West, most of the names are very difficult to pronounce. Uh, going further on that, uh, volcanic land is is a is a matter of fantasy for everyone and it's a kind of a, a something that you don't see at other places very often but thinking in terms of uh, plant growth or agriculture or even grasslands or bushes it doesn't support much of the growth for plants right so this in a way is quite contradictory to uh, a very good environmental condition there. But I'm quite surprised that because all the factors there come together and uh, it, is a, it is a kind of a mixed uh, terrain. So in spite of uh, not having so much of vegetation, because the life there is not putting any pressure on the ecology, the, the conditions are still good. And so that's I believe there will be no birds there. No birds. There are animals. birds. There are birds, but you won't find bird life as plentiful as a country with bushes and trees. So the kind mm -hmm. of birds that you usually see are more the seabirds or pelagic species, right. like squaws right. or puffins. So mm -hmm. it, it's more linked to the sea because, as such, it's it an island. So Iceland is also an island in a way because it's all surrounded by sea all over. And most of the species that you see, they, they are kind of sea species or pelagic species. So I did a couple of uh, whale tours as well there. So you go in a ship into the bay and then you explore whales or dolphins or even sharks to some extent. So that time you get to see most of the varieties of uh, birds that that are commonly seen there. So all of them are, are pelagic birds. On the ground, you, you don't see so much of bird life and also there are not many predators there. So th this is another country quite similar to 
the country where I live right now, UK, that we don't have many predators there. There, there are a uh, few predators like Arctic fox or uh, wolves. So, but it, it's not like they, they are dominating the, the landscape there. So there are, there are very few uh, species that are really being hunted there. There are limited species of deer there, which which are seen often because there is not much of tree cover, so you get to see them. But in terms of the prey and predator relationship, it 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 it's a very thinly populated country. <laughs> and hunting is not uh, is banned there. Hunting. 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 No, there are some seasons of hunting where they do controlled cull of some of the uh, deer, their deer species. And it's known that in, in Nordic countries, uh, the deer cull or some of the animal culls are very controlled. And it has been proven that uh, this cull actually helps them grow better. And it keeps a balance between their food and uh, their existence there. Because if there are too many, there is a risk of uh, various diseases spreading or some of the members of that uh, herd being ill, they spread that illness to the others. They, so that cull, which also happens in uh, Norway or Sweden, Finland, UK or Greenland, but that has a, a very firm basis, how much that is controlled and how it is done. So it is a very scientific approach to control the population of uh, the bovids and the deers there. In India, I believe uh, Andamans has got this barren island, which is yes. again a volcanic island. Yes, quite right. Have you been there? To I, island? I have done a lot of uh, Andaman study because when we were doing our book, our first book okay. on birds of Western Ghats, we were trying to establish a relationship to map the endemic species which are found in Western Ghats and how their counterparts exist in Andaman and Nicobar. Because although it is so closely uh, located to Indian coast, some of the species which are found in Andaman are very specific to that place and they are Andaman endemic species. Even the species names are named as Andaman in their form, uh, as a prefix. Yeah, so say it's a cuckoo or it's a drongo or it's a any any species is named as Andaman and then the name of the bird. But there is a big difference between uh, the habitat and ecology of Andaman as compared to Iceland because Andaman has uh, a good tree growth all over. It's quite like uh, our western ghats on the other side of the sea. There are uh, palm uh, trees all over and along with the palm you get a lot of bush there which are shrubs and and uh, mm -hmm. kind of lower growth plants which support the bird life there or even some of the animal life there so although the ground is volcanic but it, it's a kind of a semi-arid place which which stays quite evergreen throughout the year so you get lots of species in Andaman which you otherwise don't get in Iceland and other factor that matters is, is the hostile weather. Because Andaman weather is very much similar to Chennai weather or say Bangalore weather. It, because uh, it geographically it's at the same latitude, longitude kind of uh, configuration. So, but in Iceland, eh, even every day, the weather changes four times in a day. And most of the time in a year, it's so hostile that uh, for any life to survive there, it's a, it's a big challenge there because it, it's all covered in ice. Also, uh, all their food sources, they covered in, in thick snow. So that itself is a contributing factor for the number of species or num the, the kind of wildlife you see there. Very interesting place, very, very different from many other volcanic islands which are in other places, I guess. Yes. Indeed. Even Crater Lake in uh, Portland, in Oregon, yeah. is uh, formed by a volcanic eruption. 
but right. there of course it's a very different kind of weather and it's got summer and winter so each volcanic That's island true, yeah. is very very different from each other and yeah so even the terrain conditions might be similar in all these places but the weather on top of it is is very different and that actually contributes mm. in how how the things uh, are evolved there is there a volcano which is uh, still erupting there you said it and uh, i'll tell you our third last day when i was in the country there was a, a volcanic eruption right within 6 miles of our hotel and mm -hmm. uh, there is a picture that you will see in my collection where we can see in the night when we returned to our hotel we could see the orange smoke coming out and you could see the flames and it was in the news and when i was there i got so many messages from all of our friends and relatives that are you safe we read it in the news <laughs> we saw it on the tv that it is exactly at the place where you are and to be honest i got to know about that volcanic eruption through the messages that came in to me so <laughs> we were there six miles within that uh, volcanic eruption and then we had no idea that it it such a you know intense volcanic eruption but a good thing that i observed there is uh, the volcanic eruptions or the geysers that where the water comes out of of the ground scientifically they have been studied so much and there is so much of data available about them it has never caused any risk or harm for the public life okay it would never happen that uh, i'm driving somewhere and suddenly under my car some eruption will be there or maybe if if i am at a spot and i have no idea and there is there is a uh, you know kind of natural calamity that so many people are dead it never happened ever which is where the geological and the geographical data and the sciences help us in fact talking of the geysers which are which are again a volcanic activity there are fixed holes there in that that place so they are named and there are boards there that this is the geyser place so it doesn't happen although the geyser force is so much and the geyser goes several meters high up in the air so i've seen that it's it's as high as tall as a three story or four story building right but the the craters or the holes from where the uh, the they erupt is fixed and it's known so they put a boundary around that with some kind of a you know fencing and ev everything is known which is completely a miracle i mean in spite of being a geological activities every 15 minutes the geysers erupt there and it throws the same quantity of water as a as a jet in the air and i mean sometimes you wonder how could this happen that it, it's at regular interval and this has been going on for millions of years it's not it's just yesterday or few hundred years back this is a geological activity on for last several years so it is such a kind of a you know a well studied environment that it, it has never caused any risk same is true with uh, the volcanic eruptions they they have exact data they have exact uh, statistics about all these volcanoes the nature of volcanoes because every volcano is different and the way it erupts also is different so they 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 have established a very good base in terms of how harmful or how how much hazard it can cause to to us so i shared that uh, photo with you later on but uh, that that you can see the night view where from our hotel window we could see the uh, the eruption then and uh, when i was there suddenly uh, all the people they who were in that country they flocked to the to the location where the volcanic eruption occurred so many of the other bookings or many of the like boat trips or uh pre entry tickets they were all cancelled and people went to rather see the the volcano there rather than the popular hot spots okay so the, you could see the lava coming out etc yes and uh, especially in the dark hours you could clearly mm -hmm. see 
how the smoke is emerging and how the different shades of orange, red go deep up to the level where you can literally see flames coming out. Mm -hmm. So I guess what they have done is they have just let nature be without interfering. Am I correct that's, in assuming that? That's, that's a spot on statement really. So if you don't do anything to nature, it has its own way to grow and nurture. Sometimes we try to uh, you know, force our things on nature and we try to be very harsh with nature and that is where everything goes wrong. This is like a system which has been uh, surviving for years and if we let, let it go like that, just, just keep control on our degradation activities then probably that's the best way to, to keep things as they are. Yes, you're <clears throat> so, so right. Like if you try to control the geysers, build over it, for example. Yes, that's right, yeah. I don't know what would have happened. Yeah. They would have and somewhere else, I guess. Yes, exactly. And that might be something that you are going against the, the laws of nature. Probably that might cause a big crack in the ground or it might cause some kind of earthquake kind of effect which might have more hazards than what it is doing safely now. <laughs> yes, and we have Himalayas here which is such a young mountain yes. in a seismic region. I don't know how much the geologists in India are getting to have a say in development work. Definitely, yeah. And good that you mentioned about this uh, uh, seismic thing. Basically, Iceland is a tectonic plate separation where the two continents, Europe and America, are, are divided because of the, the tectonic separation. So there is a spot where you can walk through the crack between the two continents. And usually, this crack is seen uh, deep uh, into the sea. So you don't get to see it on, on, on mm -hmm. ground. Those cracks, mm -hmm. they exist in the sea, in the ocean, mm -hmm. I must say, not sea. But here, it is up on the ground and you can literally walk through the separation between those two tectonic plates. So on both sides, it's like, a, it's like two walls and you are walking through a tunnel. One side is Europe and the other side is America. So that's how the continents are separated. Oh, I wouldn't have believed that such things existed. <laughs> it's an amazing place where you see an evidence of literally the earth splitting like this. Mm -hmm. And it must have uh, split like that millions and millions of years ago. Millions. And it remains years. like that. It is only the geological uh, inferences that tell us how they, they, they would have got separated. But you don't see anything that happens now. I mean, it's not like it's still dislodging any any boulders or any any stones mm -hmm. or anything. It, it's been there for years like that now. In fact, there are some lakes and rivers formed out of that where we got to see some waterfalls, some small lakes or, or water bodies there. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. <laughs> And also what I've seen is uh, there are less number of uh, lorries and trucks going there because the as I mentioned earlier in our discussion that the, the amenities and the facilities or the outlets are very limited. So the truck or lorry uh, transportation is very less in overall in the country. And that also adds a lot to the better conditions that you see there. Iceland must be depending on other countries for most of their requirements, I suppose. Yes, there are a lot of supplies that come from other countries there and they are heavily dependent on uh, other suppliers because of the hostile weather as well. So it's yeah. not that always they can uh, grow their indigenous stuff or they can cultivate anything there. They just have to import things there and the whole model is based on maybe two or three good months of the year. Rest of the year is very hostile. Mm -hmm. 
some something like or lay lay is also just two three months are good rest of the time they are either snow bound or cut out oh, to be honest the... good that good that you mentioned about that earlier you made a reference of andama i would say that lay is very very closely uh, i mean it is very similar to the icelandic terrain and icelandic environment lay lay looks very similar is the oh, same yeah. level of tree growth same type of mountains a mix of mm -hmm. ice cap mountains and barren mountains so there is a lot of similarity between lay and uh, uh, iceland also the quality of the water the cleanliness of the water that you see in lay you know like blue waters and all the clean environment that that is exactly very similar there mm -hmm. Lay, of course, is in the lap of Himalayas, but Iceland does it have a mountain range near it? It has its own mountain range, which is within the country, and there are peaks there, but uh, they are not as high as they could uh, be listed in some of the highest mountains of the world. So it's much, much, much lower than Alps. Mm. Alps are even like. the alps that you see around french german border or french swiss border has as many more higher mountains there mm. how many days did you spend there i spent about 2 weeks there okay and uh, probably every day it was a nomadic life that you move to a neck there is something called a ring road all along the country so either you do it clockwise or you do it anti clockwise you go round that ring road and this mm -hmm. ring road is 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 about uh, say roughly 2000 kilometers okay so then you come back to the point from where you started in a cyclic manner and every day you are you are doing a night stay at a different place so you travel a few hundred kilometers then go to the next place uh, make your night nice stay there next day you are up for the next next destination so you keep on moving every night and that is how you can complete those uh, 2000 kilometers in about 10 10 days and the the most exciting thing was in spite of being such a small country every corner there is something new that is waiting for you which is different from the previous place i mean i can compare it to the uk where where i live all the time so even if you travel like 400 miles what you see around you is very similar you know it, mm -hmm. it's it's kind of you feel that you are part of the same same area but okay. here every corner you see a waterfall which probably will be the most powerful waterfall of europe or maybe it will be one of the tallest waterfall or it will be one of the broadest waterfall or maybe it will have some some different kind of cobalt water or then you go to some place where you will see a mountain valley which is built up of uh, some sandstone then you go some a few kilometers ahead you will see a gorge that is black stone or black sand or or things like that so there is so much of variety and there is so much of diversity in terms of uh, the elements of nature that you see that it is really astonishing to see such a small area of country can offer you so much probably uh, when i started my visit we started counting the waterfalls that we are visiting 1 2 3 4 5 and after 3 days we stopped counting the number of waterfalls around us because they had already crossed the a hundred waterfalls all the time so you and get they're perennial your falls sorry they are perennial waterfalls uh the year i would call them perennial because what happens as as it approaches to late autumn and winter they all freeze they all so freeze so you don't know whether they are flowing or not <laughs> okay okay so water is there because all the time there is this flow and there the such an element but there is a point in time where everything is completely frozen and this is the time when you start to start 
getting to see the northern lights, which is in fact the most significant phenomenon happening there. So mm -hmm. if at all I said it's known for something, it is known for northern lights. Okay. And uh, northern light is a phenomenon which I've seen few people who have been visiting 40 years of their life, but they never got lucky to see northern lights. Whereas mm -hmm. I have seen some people who have gone in lastminute.com bookings to Iceland and right exiting out of the airport, they saw northern lights all across the horizon. So it, it's a matter of chance and luck. But uh, northern light is something that actually has pulled so much attention for Iceland. And of That's course... That's when most I tourists think, visit, I guess. Tourists from... Probably throw right, that is the top most attraction for everyone, and everything yeah. is oriented around northern lights. Northern lights, okay. Even the local museum in the capital, Reykjavik, mm -hmm. has a section where they stimulate nor northern lights just to show everyone how they look like, okay. and it's a kind of a, a look alike of uh, northern lights. Mm -hmm. But because this time my visit was in summer, and summer is 24 hours of sunlight. So you never get any darkness in your 24 hours of duration. So when it's time for you to sleep, you have to put those, you know, eyelids on, on top, the okay. covers, and you need curtains in your room, which are dark curtains, black curtains, mm -hmm. and you have to create a night for yourself. Because outside, if you look outside the window, the sun is shining as if it's a midday. So it, it's called Midnight Sun. Mm -hmm. And this is the situation I'm, I'm telling in, say, early July or late June. And before and after that, the duration then starts coming down. So from 24 hours of sunlight, it starts reducing to 20 hours, 18 hours, 20 hours. Like it, it comes down and down and down. And probably in the peak of winter, there are only five or six hours in a day that are daylight, but otherwise it's all dark. And that is the time where you get to see uh, the northern light phenomenon. Okay. And uh, one wonderful thing that I observed there is the accuracy of the weather and environmental websites. So there's a uh, website that tells you about the changing weather and it gives you warnings and all. The second one is about the northern lights. They predict the northern light behavior and they kind of uh, tell us where is the likelihood of uh, a chance of northern light being seen this night. And uh, this is all based on geological statistics and data. And it is it is a very good resource for all of us. Mm -hmm. Because in such a place where the weather is get, going to get hostile any moment, you really need very accurate weather forecast for, for all the... My 12 days of visit can, a 12 days of visit can go in uh, 1200 hours of uh, you know talks really <laughs> I must say it has so much to, to offer and if you see the photographs or the images the videos each one has the, that variety coming in that where you see a different terrain different landscape different settings and that that tells the whole story but it's pleasure always sharing that and let me know anyone anytime wants to go there and if they need any help, any inputs, I'm happy to help and share whatever my experiences and my tips or whatever I learned from that place.